schedules. Um, the last talk today was well, given by, I think, organizers. So I'll just go ahead, just to say. Okay. Just so, so, yeah, so first of all, I apologize for shamelessly inserting myself. Okay. I'm not following the protocol that organizers shouldn't speak. But I'm, told, I'm following another protocol, which I was told that organizers can do whatever they want. <laughs> So, okay, so, but, uh, but no worries, this is going to be a short talk because this is about something that everybody knows about, which is age anomalies. And this is the work that I've done previously with uh, David McGaddy, which is a, a, a graduate student at, student at Princeton, and also with some up, upcoming work that's going to appear with David McGaddy and Wei Ming Cheng, who is in the audience here. So I just press blank. Okay, good. Okay, so usually when I talk to people who, who, not, who don't work on amplitudes, I get two questions. First is, what is amplitude hedron? And how to spell it? Oh, that's actually <laughs> and unfortunately for that question, I cannot answer. But the second question is that, uh, so yeah, so they've heard about the S-matrix program a long time ago in the 60s and the 70s, and it essentially crashed because it has no predictability. And so what is new now? And so, so, so I would like to address this question of whether or not this, this whole me modern methods of approaching scattering amplitudes have any predictability. And actually, I would like to point out that actually that question has been answered in, in various different cases a long time ago. For example, the Tooth anomaly uh, matching condition was actually shown as uh, a consequence of the uh, journey of S matrix by Coleman and Grossman in 82. There are also various different um, implications using these analytical constraints. For example, some signs of the leading irrelevant operators in an effective field theory, which can show that uh, it needs to be, in a, uh, in a, to be positive in order, order for the effective theory to be UV completed. There's various, a lot of work that shows that the complete S matrix of a massive theory can be completely fixed by just using global symmetry and consistent factorizations. Uh, of course, the recent uh, progress that proved non uh, certain the C theorem in for renormalization group, also using uh, unitarity of the scattering amplitude of Dilaton, uh, the Dilaton infected reactor. But um, so one might, might be very ambitious and say, okay, can I just throw away the action? I forget about ever thinking, knowing what the Lagrangian is, and just perturbably define my theory just using on-shell elements. And in principle, one can do this because, for example, we now know that the masses, the lowest point uh, S matrix, is essentially always completely fixed by global symmetry. Uh, Three-point masses, masses tree amplitudes are uniquely determined by global symmetries. Four-point are determined by factorization and some one new uh, ultraviolet constraints. Even if your theory doesn't have a three-point amplitude, for example, for example, nonlinear sigma model, return sigma matter theories, the first leading order is at four-point, but these are also fixed by also global symmetry and soft constraints because nonlinear sigma models are both some boson and they have to satisfy certain uh, soft conditions. So essentially, the lowest seed is is completely is given to you just by symmetry alone, and so in principle, one can just go through and apply factorization constraints that the amplitude has to factorize, and unitarity constraints where you do multiple cuts, and then just completely define your perturbative S matrix, and you're done. All, all, the, physics, all the physics that you care about is, is essentially, of course, there's a question of how efficient you can do this, but in the, in the principle level, everything is done. So the idea is that can we define per perturbative physics completely on shelf by imposing by this following procedure. First, first, we impose locality, meaning that for the physical observable we care about, we re require that the, the singularities and the branch cuts must be such that it is takes the form of either propagating going on shell or just some kinematic invariance. Can I ask a main question? Sure. sure. So, in standard field theory, uh, when, you, when we do loop calculations, we know that uh, the way that the, 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 the <coughs> wave function renormalization, mass renormalization, etc. How do I see those wave function normalizations in this well, picture? Just, well, you, once you have the tree, you can construct your loop, and you see that you have ultraviolet divergence that needs to be that it needs to be considered as correcting your tree, original tree as matrix element, and then that, that's where the normalization comes in. And by unitarity, what we mean is that on these branch cuts and singularity, essentially it has to factor right into known uh, lower point S matrix element or known lower point physical physical observable. So this is the idea. Of course, 
if we, uh, we, if we manage to do this, then essentially the whole, there's actually not, gauge symmetry never brought us anything. Because this is, now it's really been relegated to a figment of our imagination. It really, it's, it, it doesn't appear in this entire process, and it, it doesn't have any relevance in this. Of course, the first thing that one may, one may ask is, okay, so how do we know, well, then what is a gauge anomaly? How do we know a chiral theory is set? So this will be the topic of my talk. Because as you can see, everything that is feeding in here are all gauge invariants. So there's nothing for you to vary. They're all invariants. So actually, this, what this tells you is that you, there must be a way to actually recast the statement that there's a, 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 an anomaly in our gauge, gauge symmetry into something more physical. And actually, the, the, there's also another motivation, because usually the statement about our center of quantum field theory talk about gauge anomalies. The statement is that well, either there's a problem with the regulator, there, you, know, you can't find a good regulator, or, or some other problem with just the non-conservation with current. But all these seems to tell us that, okay, so for example, regulator. How do you know it's just that we're not smart enough to come up with a good regulator? That seems very artificial. And as for the gauge invariance is broken, well, that just means that your formalism is wrong. That doesn't mean there is something necessarily wrong with the physics of the system. It just means that your formalism, or you can't use your formalism. So these features of these usual statements in the in quantum field theory textbooks are somewhat a little bit artificial. So what I want to today, do today is just to point out why is this sick and why is this sick physically without using all these other constructs. You, you, would, you would think that you should get negative norm states, right? If you yeah, but usually when you say you have negative norm states, that's when you say you want to maintain Lorentz symmetry, you have some formalism. No, 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 say, say I give you the spectrum in a box of some theory. You don't know whether it has gauge invariance or not. One way, one consequence of the breaking of gauge invariance, once you know how to track it, some states that used to be coupled from the theory now cannot be coupled. Oh, but, you, but that would mean that you actually start to introduce non-physical state in the first place. No, 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 no. Uh, I think you don't, you don't know what's in the box. If you don't know what's in the box, a, 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 a signal of the sickness. Well, I mean, this is something. I'm sure, but I mean, in this in this context, I'm saying that I'm, I'm my physical observer is a physical state. I start with my spectrum. I know my physical state. I'm just scattering. I'm asking what the physical observable of that thing is. So I'm starting but with physical states. The, the, the scattering amplitude is, 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 is not conserved. Yeah, sure. So, so, but I'm, I'm so this is the question, right? I'm imposing I'm pos imposing unitarity in all of the steps. So what went wrong? So this is what I'm trying to get, right? Because this whole process is imposing locality and unitarity at each step. Okay. So now I want to see where, which, where, where something went wrong. So well, what we're doing in this talk is actually just a very simple example, which is a four-point example. And to facilitate uh, our analysis, so let me just use a, a, a known fact without proving it, which is essentially at any four-point amplitude, you can always expand on this basis which means that you're expanding on a scalar integral basis, which has either a scalar box, scalar triangle, or a scalar bubble with some coefficient. And of course, different theory just means that you have different coefficients. So if gravity has different coefficients, the amyls have different coefficients, but everything expanded is done on this basis. And you also have a, a, a R here, which represents a rational function. So what this basis means is that these, because these are just scalar integrals, these have non-trivial branch cuts where this piece is completely free of branch cuts. So the approach that one will try to do is to first, because these are branch cuts, that means that these can be detected through unitarity. These can be fixed by unitarity. So we will use unitarity to fix this part of your answer. And then on top of this part, then we, we use locality to require, we require that this whole thing to be local, local, to have the right locality property to fix this entire thing. So that is what we're we'll trying to do. So now, so since um, we don't want to try every possible uh, spectrum, so let me just consider a fermion inside a loop coupled to some gauge bosons. So this is just a simple color order. So I'm separating, so this is a four dimension simple uh, example. So I'm just separating two different pieces. So each of these pieces represents that fermion helicity is going in different directions, in opposite directions. So I'm separating these two. And what I've listed here is just the integral coefficients. It's actually you do the unitarity method, and you can you isolate the integral coefficients. And okay, so this is the answer. So all I have to do is just put the integral coefficients in front of my integral and then look at the final answer. So let's see if what happens when I do this 
uh, with, uh, when, the, when we're doing it with parity even, which means that there's no chiropermia. So if you put it with the integrated result, then this is the answer. So the coefficient multiplied by these those scalar integrals just gives you this answer. So this answer is not particularly interesting. What I want to point out is that notice that there's these u things in the denominator, which means that there's actually a pose, there's actually potential pose here in your answer, in your unitarity constructed answer. So as always, as a physicist, when we see pose, we can look at what's sitting on top of that pole. We can look at the residue. But I want to point out, first of all, that this pole is actually an unphysical pole. Because we're considering a ordered amplitude, a color ordered amplitude. So that means that this, if this had any residue, this would correspond to some factorization where it's not allowed in this amplitude. So this better have no factorization at all. But if we look at this part and you look at this on, on top of the, on the limit where this pole goes to zero, you will see that actually it has non-trivial non rational residue. So this is telling you this answer is not local because you have some non some factorization channels that are that, that are just that, that doesn't have a good physical interpretation. And this, so this better be absent. And the fact that it has to be absent tells us that what the rational piece that we were not detecting previously is, is actually uniquely fixes this rational piece. So if you introduce this piece, then the then the, the pole on top of u goes to zero exactly cancels this. And you have a perfectly nice local fun local and unitary function. So everything is fine. So now let's try to do the opposite, which is parity odd. Sorry, how do you determine the finite part of odd? Uh, so two, two constraints. First of all, it has to have such that it, it's a rational function, first of all. And then it has to, because it, can, it doesn't have branch cuts to be detected. But otherwise, all the branch cut structure has been, has been detected previously through unitary. So it has no branch cut, it has to be rational to cancel this. And further on, it has to have the right symmetry. So these have some clear cyclic symmetry. Okay. So this thing has to have the right symmetry. So that, that we need to determine this convention. But if I consider, so let me look at the parity odd combination, which is taking the two, two different directions and taking a, a relative minus sign. So you notice that again, we have these spurious Po again. So Again, the same story, we need to cancel it because it has a non-trivial residue here. And the rational term that you would introduce takes this form. Okay, so we've canceled the spurious pole, so what's wrong? Well, what's wrong is that you notice that there's this A tree sitting in front. Or uh, if I write it in another form, you, you notice that besides, uh, there's actually now an S and T factorization channel now. Now, S and T is physical, sure. But let's first look at the previous uh, parity even piece. You'll notice that there wasn't any S and T. Well, there's some S and T in, from the tree factor, but on that, on, when S or T goes to zero, there's this, this residue here actually cancels that. So there's actually nothing factorizing for the parity even. But for the parity odd, for, if S goes to zero, even though this is zero, this is not zero. So we see that Introducing something to cancel the spurious pole actually now opens a new factorization channel. Now, in order for this to be local, we better have a good, good understanding of what that thing is factorizing into. So, you, so first of all, we have we notice that the you can just count the dimension. You'll notice that the dimension has mass dimension two. So we have to ask the question. So if this is actually a true factorization, it has to factor to something that is two three points. And the combination of the mass dimension of these two has to be mass dimension two. So of course, trivial, you can have one, one, or zero, two. And you can do some helicity weight and counting. You'll see that it's uniquely determined that one, one has to be an intermediate gluon, and zero, two has to be an intermediate scalar. However, for intermediate gluon, this actually can show that this, these two are just essentially the, the usual three-point tree amplitude. And these, and, but you're at one loop, so you should factorize into a one loop times three. So if you don't have a good explanation, so this can be ruled out by the fact that you're, this is not a one-loop factorization process. For the scalar, there's actually even more worse because the scalar amplitude that was in here, I mean, I'm not putting out the detail, you can do the analysis, but you see that the scalar amplitude actually has um, higher order of pole. So essentially, there's no way of explaining this, this residue here. There's no physical interpretation of this residue. 
And therefore, this residue is just essentially inconsistent. This residue cannot be there. Now, there's still one way out, which is that U, bad U factorization, it was appearing in a particular ordering. Actually, it appears in two ordering with two different group theory factors. So if we don't introduce a rational term to cancel this U, this, this U, uh, U spherus pole, but the U spherus pole cancel it themselves because of identity with the gauge group, then we're still free. Now you can work through this identity, you can just work just by anti-community. You'll see that this factor is essentially nothing but the, the, the structure con constant times the symmetric uh, tensor. And you arrive at, you know, everything is fine if this equation is satisfied, <coughs> which is nothing but a non-abelian box and all. <coughs> so, in this four-dimension example, we see that instead of a gauge anomaly, we find that actually what happens is that there's a tension between when you're imposing, so unitarity gives us an answer, and on top of unitarity, we want to impose locality, and it just can, we cannot fix, we cannot get a consistent answer from that. And by requiring that these two are consistent with each other, we find exactly the, non, the, the usual anomalies that, 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 is, that is familiar with this field theory textbook. Now, the upshot of this analysis is, first of all, this is just based on some analytic property of physical observable. This does not, it doesn't depend on whether, how you, you got your amplitude in the first place. Because we just, we, we, we obtain our, we just do it in two steps, the unitarity and locality, and, and that's just the end of the story. The second of all, if you, if you look, go back to the original chiral parity odd, you'll see that there's no, ultra, there's no divergence in here at all. That means I never use it, there's no need for regulator. Of course, it depends on how you represent your integral, you might need an individual regulator, but because the final answer is regulator independent, that means this, no matter which regulator you use, you're gonna, you're gonna encounter the same problem. So this statement is completely regulator independent. So I have five minutes. So let me just race through <laughs> the remaining. So we want to get further approach to it. It's all consistent, it's all consistent conditions captured by this kind of an analysis. And then in fact it does. So if you go to six dimensions, you can do the same thing again. So these are the integral coefficients. So I'm not going to go into the detail of what the integral coefficients look like. But the point is that, for, for example, for six dimension QED, you find again that you have some non-trivial factorization pole in your parity odd amplitude. But at this time, the difference from four dimensions is that the mass dimension is different. It's mass dimension four. And you can see by the analysis of the residue that it always, it still has the same inter inter interpretation as the, the, um, the particles that cannot be properly explained. But now because of the mass dimension two in a little group, you can actually show that actually now for the two two um, mass dimension for the two different amplitudes, there's actually a po one possibility, which is a two form. So in other words, for the consistency of your ampli chiral amplitude in six dimension, if you have a new particle in your amplitude, which is this true form, then everything is fine, everything is local. In other words, for a chiral theory in six dimension, just by using locality and unitarity, you know you have a new particle in your spectrum. And this particle is, is a two form. And indeed, this is nothing but a green shorts mechanism. Because in six dimension, in order, order for, this is our usual statement, in, six, in higher dimension, when you have anomaly, you can cancel anomaly by introducing the, the, the two form B field. And you can actually do this for arbitrary even dimensions, and you can always use this method to show show that uh, you need a two form particle. So this is just a discussion for QCD because QCD you can also show that again you have all these uh, integral coefficients for your scalar integrals, and again looking at the factorization pole, you see that you have non-trivial uh, residues. But now it's because of your doing QCD, you find that your residue is proportional to the symmetric trace. Uh, of your generators. So in other words, if your symmetric trace is zero, there's no new residue and there's no anomaly required. This is the usual story. Now, so I'll jump through these very fast because what I want to point out is that what we realized later when we're analyzing this was that actually by imposing unitarity on locality, we find that they're actually, for higher dimension, for example, in sixth dimension, we actually, beside the unitarity part, 
you do, we still need a rational piece to cure the, to, to make the amplitude local. And what, why I want to bring this up is because it's actually very interesting to see what is this rational piece corresponds to in the usual Feynman diagram analysis because it's in principle used to be able to get the same result. And it turns out that if you do a Feynman diagram computation, so let me just jump. Besides all the all the um, you know all the branch cut part, you're going to get a rational term that looks like this. Now, as you can see, this term is going, is, is anomalous because if you do a, a word identity on that sum one, that sum one just changes to k one, and this just gives you so you do a variation on sum one. This is non-zero, but this is precisely your anomaly. But if you add what, if you add the green shorts contribution, so just to remind you what the green shorts in six dimension is, just that so you have a DFF term here, and for the three point field strength, you have a you know, transignment here, so you have another three point vertex which comes from the cross term, and so this generates non trivial contribution to the four gluon amplitude as well, and the the, the combination with the green shorts term is that it just comes into this anomalous term and it changes this factor to a minus two such that this becomes one minus one plus, uh, one minus two plus one under a gauge variation, therefore this, is gauge, this becomes gauge variation. But this is an important point. Even though the variation of your green shorts and anomaly term cancel, the green short term itself and the anomalous term doesn't cancel. So there's a remnant of this piece actually in your amplitude. And so this is the fingerprint of an anomaly. So it's not that when you anomaly cancellation, once you cancel, you forget about it. No, that's essentially just a fingerprint sitting inside your amplitude that is telling you that there, there, there once was an anomaly cancellation. And more interestingly, this factor here is actually the same factor will appear in all your branch cut dependent terms. So in other words, not only does anomaly lay, leave behind a fingerprint in this rational term, this fingerprint actually controls the entire, entire parity odd part of your amplitude. The, all the branch cut terms are under proportional to this stuff. So, in other words, so in conclusion, you see that there, there's really no gauge anomaly per se. It's just an incompatibility between unitary and locality and the rational terms of your, of your physical observable. Now, using this, uh, using this point of view, you can actually explain a lot of things very easily. For example, rational terms only appear in, in one loop, or you can just various different ways of, it, of, of telling the same why. They only appears for even dimensions. So that means anomaly can only appear in even dimensions. And parity odd, it only starts appearing at multiplicity n equals d <coughs> minus over 2 plus 1, which is also the usual case where all the anomalies can now, similar procedure can also apply to gravitational and mixed anomalies. It's essentially the same. You just use unitarity, construct your physical observable, and then impose locality, and you find you're in trouble. And for, again, for higher dimensions, you, what you get is the, the, the trouble is that it tells you that you need a new particle in your spectrum. And more interestingly, you can also apply this for theory which have Cairo two forms in six dimensions. The reason I say this is interesting is because there is no action for a Cairo two form in six dimension, or even for chiral gravity. But the, the, but the tree level S matrix elements can be fixed. And in fact, the usual statement, why is there an anomaly for chiral two form? And the usual statement is precisely the same as the following. First, there's no Lorentz invariant action in your, for chiral two form. And therefore, Lorentz, in, in the construction, there, there's no Lorentz invariant formalism to compute, and therefore something must break. And one can usually argument that there's an anomaly. So this is. But here, because it's, it's, we don't care whether or not there's an action or not, we just, you know, we just apply the, we, we fix our four point for three level S matrix, we feed it through unitarity, and there's just a problem there. I don't care whether or not you can do it with an action or not. There's just something wrong with it. You just cannot make both of these things consistent. So this is a short tale of anomalies. Uh, the, and um, yes, so this will be the end of my talk. So thank you very much. Is it possible to obtain big brain interpolation? I mean, sometimes we want to <coughs> obtain why is the new term based on anomaly. You mean the global anomalies? Uh -huh. Yeah, <coughs> yes. Well, actually, there's, a, there's another story about global anomalies. Which I, so, for example, recently, essentially the same as the following. 
in, in your physical observable, all anomalies, whether local or whether it's a gauge anomaly or a global anomaly, it's always appearing in your rational term. So for example, recently, uh, Radu Roy Ben, they looked at in supergravity, which has these various U1 anomalies. They can show that all the U1 anomalies are just coming from the, the local, the, 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 these rational terms. So if you look at your rational terms, these are essentially where all the anomalies fit. Uh, I mean, in some sense, this is trivial, right? Because you're saying your variation of your, of your scattering amplitude or whatever has a non-trivial rational piece. So that means that it must be coming from your the rational piece inside your scattering amplitude. But yeah, but you can use this analysis also for global anomaly, which is precisely what Radu Roy Ben and company did for supergravity. Uh, yes, I have a question. So, so in well, from field theory, we know that anomaly is always uh, related to instant noise, right? So how do we understand this fact? Well, there's not. I would say that this is just really coming from a different direction. Because this is really a perturbative statement, and it's just... I can... Right, because this is really just a perturbative statement, so I think this is really a statement. But I would say that, for example, the, 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 the downside of this is that I, it's very difficult to prove non for example, non-remobilization of anomalies. The anomaly is one of those two exact. And for example, with an anomaly, which is a goal, which is a large gauge transformation anomaly, would be very difficult to, to, to discuss. I guess, is this an instant term? What does this part change this amount to do with the number of zero modes? The number of zero modes to do with uh, that you have to quotient out for the, for the gauge Okay, I mean, we're, we're, I mean, using this is we're, we're essentially arriving at the same result, right? Right. So I don't see really what the what, where we need to. Do. Well, I have another question. And how do you compare this approach to um, Fujikawa's uh, positive approach? Yes. And or um, which? No, but I mean those are the problem with those approaches. I mean, like well, precisely the problem is with this guy. Once you don't have an action, then you can you cannot use any of those approaches. If you don't have a path in the grow, you cannot use any of those approaches. You don't you don't have an action to sit inside your path in So what about weight little consistency? Con consistent condition <coughs> is a quite popular method to calculate. Um, no, that's a different thing. So this is a different thing. It gives you the form of your anomaly, right? It gives you consistent, but not coefficients. Yes, and not quite, but it gives you a, a form of your norm. Okay, let me, let me ask this question. If I give you a form of it, if I say that you have a certain symmetry and you have cons and you have counter terms that satisfy this symmetry, this is just like what's amino consistent because you have consistent anomaly. Does that mean that a theory has to have and be anomalous? Or in other words, does it mean that a theory has to have ultraviolet divergence? We already know that there's an example where you have consistent counter terms where the theory is not divergent even though you have consistent counter terms. So I think this is a stronger statement because this is saying I don't care, I mean, this is just computing the physical observable and there's a problem in here. This is this is not generating a, a candidate counter, uh, candidate anomaly or candidate counter term. This is just telling this is this there. And there's another, no way, another way to do uh, anomaly. Yeah, I mean this Low is- quality and of course, this is, this is well known, right? Because people usually, okay, once you have a one loop triangle anomaly, then you have a two loop, you say that the longitudinal, the two loop level, then the, the longitudinal is also decoupled. But this is just a more clean statement. Yeah. <coughs> okay. I think it has been a long day. So yeah. Let's close the afternoon session. Yeah. Do you have any announcements? Uh, yes, I mean.